five hours. My brother had just installed Diablo 1. It was just so addicting. He kept going further and further into the dungeon. It was like, this is so good. Yeah, no, that was definitely my experience as well. I could play it all night after school. Today on Deep Space, we have the lead principal game designer at Second Dinner. Glenn Jones is here. Everyone give a warm welcome to Glenn. Let's get those emojis going in the chat, guys. And thank you so much for being here today. How was your weekend so far? Uh, it's been pretty good. Had kind of an unexpected vet visit today, actually, but overall, a good weekend and nothing going awry with the pets either, so all good. Oh, wonderful. Uh, was it was it like a scary, like emergency style visit or? Uh, not, not exactly. We had like a prescription go out and then one of our dogs kind of has a, a disorder, so he started acting up, but all good. Right on, right on. All right, so let's start off the show with your early gaming career. What was the first gaming system you tinkered with? Uh, yeah, it was definitely an Atari. I We had one in like the family room of the house. So I remember playing Pit. There was like a Star Wars game. There's a, a tank game I really liked. I'm spacing on its name, but it's like kind of seminal, the gr black and green aesthetic, if people remember that one. Uh, and there was just a variety of games. I, I think we had like 20 or so. My dad's always been really into technology, so he always bought like whatever new thing. Never got to play on a Commodore 64, but pretty much everything Atari forward, I played on for some amount of time. That's super cool. My uh, dad had a Jokari. Do you, have you heard of that before? I have not, no. It's like hardware pong. Like it had to. Oh! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Super, fu super funny, man. When he whipped that out, I'm like, Dad, what is this? And it, it, it still had like the antenna prongs, you know, like the UHF hookup. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Young kids don't know about that these days. So was no, that the catalyst not. that got you into gaming hardcore that happened at a later time, you think? Yeah, not, not really. I mean, it was just sort of a thing that was always around. So like, I liked them. I did notice that being like one of the kids with a Game Boy at daycare made me a lot more popular than when I did not have a Game Boy. That was a pretty clear <laughs> delineation in my, my social growth there. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of just played games on consoles and like various things for a long time. And I didn't really like get into gaming as like, oh, like gaming's gonna be a pretty meaningful part of my identity until around like middle school. I made some friends in like sixth through eighth grade who were really into FPS games, specifically Counter-Strike and Day of Defeat and Halo and some other stuff too. Like we played Super Smash Brothers a lot as well. And we wound up doing like LAN parties where we'd all get together and just play as a team against random teams on the internet. And yeah, that was where I really kind of got into gaming as like, a uh, community and an industry and, and a real space. Uh, and we actually did eventually get into the Cyber Athlete League where we were very mediocre for a handful of years until we all went to college, so. That's pretty cool. So did you do the Day of Defeat on the Steam beta as well? Uh, yeah, I was. we played on the original Day of Defeat and then right, our, our team kind of like coalesced into like Cal Caliber right as things switched over to Source. That was when we played the most was uh, when it switched over everything to Source. Uh, do you still play FPS games? Is that something you're still into? No. Um, yeah, like after like freshman year of college, I basically just stopped. Uh, I didn't have anyone to play with. All of my friends moved to, to, we all went to different colleges and different games became popular. I started playing a lot more Magic and poker around that time. So just kind of fell off of FPS games. And I, I actually literally went like a, maybe a decade without playing more than like a handful of minutes of an FPS game. Uh, and then I have some friends who work on Destiny 2 now and they wanted to like play and show me some elements of the game. And like I started playing, I was like, oh my God, I am so horrendous at these games <laughs> now relative to what, I, and I wasn't good before by like any real standard, but I was like, you know, I beat up like random people, but I was like, oh my God, no, this is very embarrassing. I saw that going differently in my head. I was like, oh, he's gonna be like, oh my God, I missed this so much. This is amazing. <laughs> I do like the, the games a lot. Way. Yeah, I think they're really cool. But yeah, I just my my skill atrophied pretty uh, dramatically. Gotcha. All right. I'm guessing that you're not probably going to be playing Rivals. Is that right? I'm certainly going to play it a little bit. I've already poked around in some of the the beta and alpha stuff. Like keep an eye on that. So we're all you know part of a big Marvel family. So yeah. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Well, awesome. All right, so let's take a peek at some of the games that Glenn used to play along with the card games that he played along the route. So let's take a look at that. First one up is this one. If you could just share with us what we're looking at. These are, it looks like the FPS oh, yeah. games. Yeah, this is actually a slide I kind of put together. We do everywhere I've worked actually in gaming. We do a, a practice called like Pecha Cucho where you kind of 
do a quick life story for yourself in slides. Mm -hmm. So this one is kind of like my foray into like real gaming slide. And yeah, like I played, as we mentioned, Counter-Strike Day Defeat a lot. I really liked Civilization and various 4X games. Like I played those on my own. Uh, Spellbinder was actually the first FPS game I got into. So if anybody happens to randomly know what that game is, it's basically with where you're with all wizards shooting each other with spells. And uh, Din Diablo is obviously quite seminal. Uh, I had never played the original Di Diablo, but I got in with Diablo 2 and was quite taken with the genre for a good good couple of years. Uh, I don't really play the RPG space very often, but those it was definitely just like, oh, this is a totally new kind of thing, like versus running around Super Mario Brothers. For sure. I remember sitting down at my, my father's computer and my brother had just installed Diablo 1 and... I was like, what is this, right? And I sit down and start playing, and like, I literally teleported five hours. Yep. <laughs> and it was dark outside, and I was still playing Diablo. I'm like, oh my god, this game is dangerous. It was just so addicting. You kept going further and further into the dungeon. It was like, oh, this is so good. Yeah, no, that was definitely my experience as well. I could play it all night after school. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so check this out. Next one is the card games, guys. Let's take a look at them. Yeah, honestly, I've probably added technically some since these, but these were like the games I played kind of before I started working in game design properly. I actually started with Magic, which is a little unusual. Most people kind of intro to Magic from somewhere else, but Magic was my first card game. And I played all of these to some level of competition, like the least was versus. I figured out pretty fast that there were a lot of really good people in the versus card game. So uh, I wound up just stopping playing it because like all of the Magic players who were better than me uh, just started playing versus. And I was like, oh, I don't need to lose to you guys in two tournaments a week. We can just call that a day. But yeah, I won lots of Pokemon tournaments that were local, various like Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments for like cash money in Florida. They were running like $1,000 tournaments for Yu-Gi-Oh every like two weeks, every four weeks, different stores. So I actually, like, once I had my driver's license, like, drove around Florida a bit just playing in Yu-Gi-Oh! 1Ks to make money on the side. And I really liked a lot of the anime card games. I thought they were quite fun and really different from Magic. So I played the Dragon Ball Z one and the Yu Yu Hakusho uh, TCG as well. I'm actually the reigning runner-up world champion of the Yu Yu Hakusho TCG. So were you like the the rounders of Yu-Gi-Oh? <laughs> no, no. I was, I was pretty annoying to some locals. There was like a team of local people who were like pretty competitive and eventually they actually invited me to join their team and like play test with them and go to events with them and that was cool like i, I didn't really have many friends in Yu-Gi-Oh! it was just a game i was playing uh, and i found out like a few years later one of the reasons they had asked me to join the team was that i kept declining the prize splits when they were in top four with me so they wanted to me to start <laughs> agreeing to split prizes uh, and i was like <laughs> oh that's somewhat reasonable sure but just a funny outcome for them because it would be like two of them and one of me and it would, i would just be taking at least 25 percent of their prizes a decent amount of the time so you mentioned magic the gathering in that group i played magic for yeah. a bit what was your favorite color deck to play uh when i was like really early on in magic i enjoyed playing uh, a lot of blue and a lot of green. Later on in my career, I, I preferred red. Red was my favorite for many years. I played a couple of reasonably competitive events with a variety of like aggressive red decks, so I was pretty happy with those decks. Very cool. So this is going to transition perfectly into our next segment. A few weeks back, we had Jeff Hoagland on the show, and we got to watch a clip of both you and him at Star City Games. I mean, you looked really young in that video. Can you tell us what you did for Star City, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah. I had graduated college, and while I was in college, and a little bit after, I had a part-time gig with a friend from the World of Warcraft TCG and minis game, where they were running competitive events all over the world, and I would get flown out to do event coverage for those. I'd volunteered to do it at like a national championship one time, so... I basically covered all of their competitive events except for Worlds, where I usually played. And I did I did pretty well at, at Worlds. I fin think I finished top 20 both times I played at their World Championships. But yeah, it was a fun, fun game. I liked a lot of the people I met, and the person who ran coverage for that team wound up going to Star City Games to kind of be like their lead graphic designer when they were putting together what eventually became like SCG Live, the Star City Games tournament circuit that was a pretty huge deal uh, in Magic for a chunk of time as it kind of became a real a secondary kind of like minor league circuit to the Magic Pro level play. And he offered to kind of have me join that team and help them build it up as like the lead on actually going to the events and covering them. 
And at the time, I was basically just playing Magic and Poker and this other coverage gig as like my primary sources of income. And I kind of had to like you know, look in the mirror and be like, all right, do I think that that's going to sustain for a super long time? Or should I like start putting this English history uh, double useless degree uh, to work? <laughs> Right. And wound up deciding to at least take the gig. Worst case scenario, I figured, you know, it was a few years and some interesting experiences. Uh, and there was a lot of travel, so I thought that would be a lot of fun. And it was. I wound up flying or, tra or traveling somewhere like 28 weekends a year for like three years leading coverage there. We built up SCG Live basically from scratch with the help of GG's Live, which was a, a contractor who they'd been working with that got started and then everything moved in-house. And a, a lot of that in-house team is even still there to this day that we hired while I was there. Uh, making great content and I was really proud of the work that we did as a coverage organization like we hit numbers that the Magic Pro Tour and Grand Prix circuits were like struggling to hit with our viewer counts and our tournaments were really popular for a good three years we were like really really proud of the outcomes there and yeah I, I was the I think lead coverage content coordinator lead senior coverage content coordinator I think was my title when I left and I wound up leaving to take a, a sales job with a distributorship providing like wholesale board games and magic and stuff like that to local game stores in the California area, just completely changed coasts, basically. <laughs> yeah. You went from like Midwest to, to out to Cali, yeah? Yeah, I mean, Virginia is like East Coast, but it feels Midwest, if that oh, like makes sense. I thought like, like the it's Star like the City was only like Coast. in Midwest, no? That was where a lot of the tournaments were, like, because part of the actual premise of the tournament circuit itself was that it helped to generate interest in coming to the events and coming to the events. Like, Star City Games is ultimately a buyer and seller of Magic cards, so they the the real money that they made on those tournaments was all the people who showed up to the event and sold Magic cards to them, which they would then, you know, put on the website, sell those. So, yeah. I mean, that's a great model. Uh, so how long it were you at Star City? About three years, I think, yeah. And if you could like just 22 to 25, something provide like that. us a recap from from your time. From, I, know, I mean, I know you from Star City, you went to the wholesaler, but where, how did you get to second dinner eventually? What was the, the path you took? That was a pretty lengthy one. Yeah, so I was at, at the wholesaler very briefly. Uh, it was a sales job and I had not really done that before, but I quickly kind of figured out that sales was not the job for me. So I went ahead and started looking for other opportunities. And around that time, Wizards was actually hiring for a magic editor. Uh, and one of the editors at Wizards, who has since moved on, named Tim, he wrote an article that made the job sound pretty interesting. So I wound up applying. I went through the whole rigmarole, did some testing, some interviews, and got second place, did not get the job. But over the course of doing the testing and all the interviews, I was like, actually, that seemed like a pretty cool job and a pretty cool place to work. So I decided I would just quit my California job that I hated and move to Seattle and hang out there to see if I could get a job at Wizards. And shortly after I did that, like a few months had kind of transpired. I played a Magic Pro Tour in the interim, actually, and Magic reached back out because the person they'd hired instead of me had wound up sh shifting to a different role in the company and so the slot was open again and they just rather than do another round of hiring they just offered it to me and i was like oh yeah that works out great <laughs> so i didn't have to run much of a risk i just had to kind of wait a few months until i could start once i moved to seattle and that was it i started editing magic cards i did that for like a like 18 months something like that maybe maybe longer maybe two years and then Wizards was working at the time on a mobile game project codenamed Blitz, which eventually became Spellslingers, which released out like two and a half years ago or something like that. But in the early development, I thought it sounded like a really cool opportunity to be attached to as a game. Uh, and I was kind of looking to get out of editing, so or at least editing something else. So I was like, well, maybe I'll, you know, join the Spellslingers team as a editor or maybe a producer. And I wound up contributing to the game design work while I was working with that team. And they wound up hiring me on as a game designer instead. So I just kind of totally shifted gears and roles, became the lead of their second team or the lead of their second set and switched to the magic design team where I led Commander 2019. This was the first magic set that I led design for, but I'd been on, I think at that point, three Commander design sets as like a, a helper designer, basically. Yeah. So yeah, once I started leading magic design, it just kind of took off from there. I got put in charge of more and more things. I think there was a lot of luck and kismet in it for me because I was one of the people doing a lot of work with the commander community and the game design for the commander format at the same time that Wizards was kind of coming to realize that it was a, a really popular, really important format for them to cater to. So I hopped right on that train and it 
ran up to a pretty awesome city where I got to hang out for, I think I was at Wizards for about seven, maybe seven and a half years. And by when I left, yeah, I had become, become the technical design lead for the Commander format. I was also leading a lot of the work on the Universes Beyond stuff, which was magic working with external IPs. I led the Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering set while I was there, which was one of the coolest things I'll definitely ever get to do, so very exciting. And the best-selling magic set of all time, so I get to <laughs> sit on that laurel until inflation or an equally amazing magic set takes me down in the right. near future. And so I, I wound up coming to Second Dinner because I was really interested in learning more about digital gaming. I do think there's a huge future in it. Obviously, I had enjoyed working on Spell Slingers, but the game kind of didn't pan out the way that we had hoped. Uh, we kind of just, it kind of just got released basically with the expectation that it would kind of peter out, but we would just you know, see it go live and see what happened and learn from it. So I was eager for a chance to get a look at how other teams handle this kind of thing. Second dinner, you know, new company, new game, a lot of uh, strong people from around the industry who had worked at a lot of different places that I could learn from. Right. Uh, so it just seemed like a really cool opportunity. I couldn't think of a lot of jobs that were comparable that I would have taken and left Wizards behind for. Right. So I thought, you know, given that, why don't we try this one out while, while I'm young and see how it goes. And yeah, I think it worked out pretty well. I, I'd say so. We love the game. Thank you so much for, for helping design and, and make it better. Guys, we have some career pictures to show. Glenn in the in the wild here. Let's see the first one. Boom! This looks like yeah, a star. Stars. Yeah, the the top left is the World of Warcraft. I think that's the North American Championship match actually being played. I was doing coverage of that match. And then to the right, uh, top right is one of those very early Star City Games tournament coverage booths. I think like that might literally be like one of the 10 first ones we did, something like that. Uh, it wasn't even, we re rebranded to SCG Live, so that hadn't even happened yet uh, when we took that picture. Uh, and you can see we've got a variety of chairs holding up our cameras since we didn't spring for all of the fancy tech that SCG now has like two studios worth of technology. Pretty amazing. And the bottom left is Game State, a little podcast I did with a variety of luminaries of gaming who have gone on to do different things since then, including Cedric, who uh, I keep in touch with a little bit for Magic. And then by the end of SCG, we were doing some really high production value stuff, like the bottom right thing, which is called Above the Curve, sort of modeled off of some of those ESPN shows covering what's going on in Magic, what's going on in the formats and the metagames and with competitive play and players. And that was Ultimately ill-fated, I think it just costs too much time and effort to put together, plus all the people involved in it were, you know, also very busy doing a variety of scheduled tournaments and travel and things like that. So uh, I think it wound up sunsetting after 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 I'd left. I know it stayed uh, like another around for about a year after I left, but I think yeah, it wound up getting sunset so I could put all the resources into uh, the Commander versus stuff, which has done really well for Star City Games since then. Oh man, that, I mean, that's awesome. I, that, that looks better produced than than this show my dude that that, that was awesome all right yeah, they, they scg hired some awesome producers there and i know at least the the lead is still there and he's he's great very cool next one is i believe your career path so let's take a look there you gave us a verbal synopsis but here oh, you yeah. guys can see it in action and you've, you've done some great things in your career this is this is impressive glenn yeah, I'm happy to have landed at like a lot of pretty awesome places versus a wide variety of things that kind of range in in quality. I think I picked up something pretty great from everywhere I wandered by. And, you know, if you look at a resume and you see like World of Warcraft, Magic the Gathering, Marvel Snap, it's like a pretty good looking resume, I think. So, yeah. All right. So I think this is probably a good time to toss in our first community question. Are you able to provide your vision for the longevity of the game? I mean, certainly I wouldn't have popped over uh, to Snap if I wasn't planning for it to be a pretty long running game. I mean, I was, I was working on a game that's 35 plus years old now or something at the time. So yeah, I, I came over expecting to be able to do something really unique and important with Snap. Um, so I remember early on, actually, some people would ask me, you know, like, I'm worried about this. Like, how do you think we'll fix it? And I'm like, it's my job to fix that. So I'll, I'll work on it. And I think we've, you know, continuing, we're finding out more and more about what that means as we continue to go through the growing pains of kind of becoming an established game in the CCG space. But certainly, yeah, like that's my goal is to make SAP something that's sustainable that can last like 
10 years, certainly want to be talking about Snap the way that people talk about Hearthstone today, long term, like as this kind of seminal foundational piece of the digital CCG landscape. Uh, and I think, you know, I think we're on our way. I think we've got a really special start and hopefully we can just continue to deliver and iterate and improve, which is one of the things I'm really happy with Second Dinner is there's a really strong culture around just getting constantly better at things. That's what everyone wants to do. Yeah, I mean, it's not lost on me that since you've joined on, we've had the Imbalance event, the, you know, Deadpool's Diner, which was absolutely awesome. So thank you for that. The rewards were absolutely fire. I mean, having fixed that early game experience, I, I believe it's it's ripe for a, another run here fairly soon. And, you know, big thank you for yeah. me, at least. You know, I, I know a lot of my my friends in the community enjoyed the the event on the whole. Yeah, I was pretty happy with it. I actually did not have a lot to do with the development of Deadpool's Diner. I, pl I play tested it and provided a lot of feedback, but it was largely driven by our product team, which Steven Jarrett is popular on our Discord as well. I did a lot of the leadership for that. And uh, yeah, I, I think it went really well. I'm really glad we were able to make some fast improvements and we've got you know more ideas for longer term improvements as well. Uh, I think I think it's super great. And Imbalance Events, also kind of a brainchild. I think actually our marketing, VP Allen, who had also worked at with Wizards briefly, had kind of pitched something that eventually became Imbalance Events, uh, and I coded those. I coded both of those almost completely myself, and was pretty happy with them. I, I certainly was glad that the community enjoyed them. I think that ultimately they they more illustrated like, oh, there's an appetite for something like really unique in this space, as opposed to established like Imbalance Events are awesome. We should do them all the time. So that was my big takeaway from those. Is like, what can I how can I bring what was awesome about Imbalance events into, into like a really polished feature that players will be excited to play for months or even years? For sure, man. That I mean, that's great. All right. So moving to our next topic. Well, first, let me ask you about alliances. Are you in an alliance currently? Because we may I or am. may not have a space for you if you need one. No, I'm in one of the second dinner has a couple of alliances. So I've popped my way into one of those. OK, perfect. So my lead researcher has shared that you have a pretty close-knit group of friends. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I certainly have a lot of friends local that I've made through Wizards and Gaming, but all of my friends from like my college magic days, we, we keep in, in touch, chats in various ways virtually online. One of them actually just celebrating an imminent child, so that's pretty dope. And yeah, we, we get together about once a year in person somewhere and just play board games and magic and yell at each other and shop for terrible food or complain about whatever house we rented. Uh, you know, th the things everyone does when you get four 14 or so random guys to play games together for a weekend. What what would you say was your favorite destination for this annual get together? Honestly, one we're going to repeat, repeat soon. There's a, a place called a Gamer's Ranch in like the middle of Missouri. That's just this, this awesome guy has basically put together a, a super Airbnb for gaming specifically it's a giant house i think like 20 people can stay there there's like a console in every room he has every board game i can literally think of that's and amazing. i can think of a lot that's not like i mean maybe he's saying hyperbole i like literally typed 50 games where i was like i might want to play these and he had them all and i'm like all right that's a lot yeah i think he, he stocks like basically just everything that seems even remotely reasonable um yeah su super great venue if you're you know in the market for some way to host like 20 people who all want to play games for an indeterminate amount of time it's a super great venue if uh, I mean you mentioned board games, I'm I'm a little bit of a board game person myself. What is your favorite board game currently? Uh, currently, I've got this game. I'm I'm enjoying. A, I actually just taught my my wife to play Hive, and we've been enjoying playing that together quite a bit. But I personally have been really interested in uh, that time you killed me as a, a game. I've been getting people to play me play me in whenever I can find the opportunity to haul it around, mm -hmm. uh, basically, because it's got a bit of a big box. But it's kind of a, a game premised on this concept of a four-dimensional chess, if you remember that Twitch phenomenon that was very brief in which time travel chess was kind of a thing. Someone inspired by that kind of built a board game around playing a chess-like game across three boards representing different time zones or time timelines. Uh, so like you can plant a seed on like the board, the past board and it will put a tree on your present board or your future board uh, that you then try and like knock other pieces into and things like that. Uh, it's a super, super cool game, really imaginative. And I actually decided to pick it up based on reading the design diary of the designer, which was really excellently written, but captured uh, a ton of nuances of game design that I thought were, were really awesome. And I've, I've since added it to some curriculum I teach. 
Oh, very cool. Well, let's talk about that. Hold on. Back it up. Glenn Jones is a teacher. <laughs> I am, yeah. I, I took, when I first became a game designer, I took a certificate course at the University of Washington in game design because uh, Wizards obviously was a great company, has a lot of game designers providing kind of osmosis style education there. But I thought it would be, it, I thought it would behoove me to go outside of the company and try to get some other ideas about what game design is, how to like really formally engage in it. So. I took this certificate course at the University of Washington, met a variety of cool people there, as well as the instructors. And I wound up coming back to join the program as a board member and advisor for the future. And then they opened up a slot for a teacher and asked me if I wanted to do it. So I actually taught my first class early this, this last year. Yeah, 2024, like spring semester, I taught a 10 week course and I'll be repeating it again in the near future. That's super cool. That's awesome. All right, so we actually have a picture of Glenn with the friends group. Let's take a look here. This venue looks really awesome, by the way. Oh, uh, yes, this was, I think, two or three years ago, we did a cruise. It was And it was definitely probably my second favorite of our venues. It was nice to not have to worry about food and, and lodging. Like, we just wander all over the boats. Uh, it had a casino, which was nice for a num number of us. This was certainly our, our formal dinner night. Yeah, this, I mean, this looks beautiful. What cruise line was this, if you don't mind me asking? I wish I remembered. I think I'm going to guess it was Carnival. It was, it was just one of the big ones. We didn't do anything like novel. Right on. Yeah. I know it was shortly after Captain Marvel had, had come out of her call, because I remember they had the movie, and I was like, oh, that's weird. Like, <laughs> so it's like a two two months or so after it came out, something like that, yeah. All right, so we're gonna get a little personal here. We're gonna talk about family. Are you married, sir? The ladies need to know. I am. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been married, if you don't mind? Uh, about going going on like four years now. Yeah, we have an anniversary coming up in October. Big ones next year. Don't mess it up. It's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the first real judgment year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> do fine. The big we'll one. do fine. All right, and you also have three small babies you're taking care of. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, fur babies, yeah. We have uh, we have three dogs, which, if, if you're ever wondering, is one too many. Uh, don't the third dog? Don't get it. Uh, in general, I think that's good advice. But we do love them all. Just we, you know, could could love two of them much much more efficiently. I would say. But yeah, they're they're great. Um, they range in ages from I think we have like eleven, seven, and two. Basically, are their ages. And they're all poodle mixes, which I think that's, we're committed to that. We really love poodle mixes. They're really smart breeds, really, really beautiful dogs and very curious and smart. Yeah, just, just love them. So we have pictures to share of the fur babies. If you could just set us up, let us know what we're looking at, which dog is which. Oh yeah, of course. Here we go. Yeah, the the top left is Bear. He's our youngest at two, also our biggest, uh, about about 30 pounds, just five five to 10 more pounds than he was supposed to be. The top right is our oldest, Milo. He's about 11. And then bottom right is Loha, who's in the, the middle child at seven. Uh, Loha, actually, we adopted from Korea, uh, interestingly enough. But yeah, the others were all from, from local places. So you went to Korea to get the dog or it was shipped? We did not. There was a, a shelter in, that's based in Seattle that one of the members of that shelter is from Korea. And she brings back dogs from kill shelters in Korea to rescue as many as she can on her trips. And then they foster them uh, in Seattle until they can find them home. So Loha was one such dog that they, they brought back. Yeah, my, my dogs from Puerto Rico, similar story through the rescue, they brought them back. And that's how we ended up with Marco. But he's he's quite yeah, a bit love, bigger love than, uh, than your dogs. <laughs> All right, next picture. Yeah, there they are again. Milo and Bear honestly like kind of hate each other, so it's uh, tricky to get pictures of them near each other, but have managed to do it a few times now. But Bear and Loha, on the two on the right, they get along quite famously, wrestle all the time. Uh, Bear's like twice as heavy as Loha, but she wins pretty much every time, so it's pretty funny. Oh, he's a gentle giant. So yeah, you say they don't a, a like each other. What, if, what do they do? Do they do they like shadow box? Milo basically just very protective of his space. He kind of okay. just doesn't want anyone stepping near him. So yeah, they. It's more that Milo wants Bear to not be there, and Bear is more just like this guy seems mean. So, <laughs> and he's right. He's, he can be a little mean. So. Awesome. So one of the most interesting things our research team has brought to my attention is that you are a fan of experiences and trying new things. I mean, having heard about your career path, like that's totally relatable. Tell us a little bit about your hobbies, your yeah. interests, 
if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, I'm generally, I really like creative hobbies and the entertainment space. I'm actually, interestingly enough, I think like from like a personality standpoint and kind of my approach to work, I'm like fairly robotic and really routine oriented, all about data and getting everything kind of like finessed. Uh, but I do apply that to a lot of creative endeavors. I, I just like to learn new skills and try them out. Right now, I've actually very recently started picking up chess a little bit more seriously than I had before, like learning openings and things like that versus just the basic premises of the game. Yeah. But yeah, I love, in general art, I always drew as a kid. It was just something I enjoyed doing and it was constantly accessible. So anything in that space like my my grandfather on my mother's side was a painter also kind of instilled with me uh, a great joy in that uh, just exploring different ways to represent the world like look at things in different lights play with different mediums and materials um i wound up really kind of liking charcoal uh, that's my favorite way to draw it kind of captures this like ability to be really technical and precise with this very forgiving capacity to mix and blend and yeah. create something that even doesn't look quite right but still looks really really nice and I, I picked it up in college and it was very popular with the young women at my university as well so that was certainly a perk that uh, that was nice very cheap <laughs> gift uh, if you want to pick up charcoal portraiture really really cheap really awesome gift to give people yes. and then other than that yeah like anything um re this year actually my wife and i've kind of started a new tradition of learning pumpkin carving so we each took our, our first forays into pumpkin carving since at least we were we were very very young although i'm not sure my wife had actually carved i don't think she had carved a pumpkin before i think her family had but i don't think she had and i hadn't done it for you know 20 25 years or something so so a little foreshadowing here the dude can carve how about your wife's because i don't think you sent me a picture of your wife's this, did hers come out quite as good <laughs> uh, she's she's still working it out well this year it will be <laughs> I think a significant improvement over last year. I look forward to to publishing her work in the future. <laughs> could I could I could I just personally get the before and afters? I don't. I won't share them. Uh, I just want to see them. I'll I'll see if I can track it down. I don't have my my photos super well sorted, but yeah, I'll 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 let you see. <laughs> oh man! All right, and so like you're trying all these new things. To what degree do you go into it? Like. If I'm into something, I'm in it 100%. Like when I was in in, yeah. in doing chess in, in high school, I would be going to camps, I'd be reading books, you know, just immersing myself in that and like trying to get as good as I can get in that space within, you know, however long I'm going to be doing it. Are, are you that way or do you just kind of dip your yeah. toes in it? Yeah, I actually, I am that kind of that way. I actually have been diagnosed with ADHD. I have kind of a version of it that's a little bit on the unusual side. Most people really associate ADHD with like, you can't focus on things, but the, the more technical definition I've been, as it's been explained to me, is that you can't control what you focus on. Uh, so in my case, I hyper-focus. Like I find it really difficult to focus on things other than the thing I'm interested in right now. So I have to, you know, work out a variety of systems to kind of make that work. Uh, when it comes to things like honing a game it can be really useful, but certainly yeah, from a hobby standpoint, I tend to like set one hobby down to work on another. So like charcoal is a good example. Like if I'm going to do charcoal drawings, I'll like, I do it like once a year and I, you know, take like six hours per drawing, like in a day to just like go at it for a while. And then I just don't touch it again for a year or two until I come back, kind of do it the exact same way. So stuff like pumpkin carving is actually like ideal in a way because it's already confined to a very specific intense space. <laughs> do you guys do pumpkin carving contests at second dinner? Uh, we don't, we're, we're fully remote. So it's a little trickier than at some other companies, but I don't see why we couldn't. We could just post up pictures. Yeah, I don't think anyone's ever, ever suggested it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll suggest it this year. Or if you want to do something smaller. So at, at my office, they did pepper carvings like with the like little tiny knives and stuff. <laughs> so like who could carve the best pepper? <laughs> that was fun. Oh, that's adorable. All right, probably so just mini pumpkins. I think my, my wife's, one of her companies did mini pumpkin carving. That was pretty cute. Oh, that is neat. What other hobbies have you tried aside from pumpkin carving and charcoals and I'm assuming painting? Yeah, I mean, right? gaming, gaming is a unique hobby because it really keeps you busy. There's always something new and really different to do. So I, I really do study a lot as much as I study probably way more than I play these days. Outside of that, I do enjoy cooking. It's sort of similar to gaming or even chess more specifically. I just want to learn, you know, like a handful of things like really well and then stop <laughs> learning all of these other things. Uh, so that's very much my, my approach to cooking is trying to find like a couple of dishes for every meal that I, I'm happy to be a master of. So I enjoy doing that, finding different ingredients and mixes and marinades and things like that to work on. Uh, I find that 
pretty pretty enjoyable just to think about. Uh, What's and your then favorite other dish that, really so far games. that you've like? Yeah, I really recently started experimenting a lot more with salmon and preparing it in a variety of different ways. It's pretty pretty versatile protein, so I've been enjoying that. I also recently had the the brainstorm to saute bananas in with a little bit of brown sugar and just toss the, that into instant oatmeal and basically make bananas foster instant oatmeal. Super easy, super delicious. If you're an instant oatmeal consumer, strong recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Man, after my own heart, dude. Ooh, brown sugar bananas, that sounds delicious. All right, so yeah, this brings us to good. another community question. Do you have any technical hobbies? Like, could we see a Glenn platformer hitting the indie shelves in a couple years, or perhaps a book on the challenges of game development? Yeah, I have like a light interest in stuff like that. I actually had not written any code until I started working at Second Dinner. So I, I'm learn, I've learned, everything I've learned on that level has come in the last couple of years. But I have been kind of building games for myself on the side as kind of an educational practice and a creative outlet as well. So, you know, Second Dinner, obviously I work there, so there's a legal relationship between like what I could do independently versus what I would submit through and just publish alongside Second Dinner in some capacity. But yeah, I, I think in the future there's a decent chance I'll release something of my own, maybe maybe after Second Dinner. Hey everybody, Obehaved behaved here. We got him. Goodbye, sir. I've put together some highlights for you to show you a little bit about what we're about here on this channel. Oh, he doesn't get the Elsa buff either. Oh, no. I'm sorry, friend. Don't hate me. That four right on the chin. So big. So powerful. Dudes, we did it. Look, we're under 5K. We did it! Oh my god, two for two! <laughs> Snap! If you want to hang out or just have fun, drop me a follow if you're on Twitch. Or subscribe if you're on YouTube. And have a good time. I do continue, intend to continue teaching and finding ways to explore that. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility I write a book. Probably more likely I do something like a blog. And a GDC talk is one of the things I kind of have on my goals list to figure out a topic I think I would have a, a great take on and then execute on that for the Game Developers Conference, which uh, I've re always really enjoyed their talks. They're very educational. If you're interested in game design, uh, it's one of the primary resources to get better at it. You have to be kind of selective. There's a lot of talks and depending on what you want to learn, it can be difficult to find the best ones, but there's some really good stuff even on just the free side. Right on. So we did have pictures of Glenn's art to share, but apparently in my travels yesterday, <laughs> I forgot to add them. So let me see if I can, I can snag them here really quickly. This is going to be real scuffy and I apologize guys. I know I should have done this ahead of time, but bear with me. Let's see if we can get her done. While I bring this up, can you tell us what do you think is your favorite painting you've done thus far? That's a good question. I definitely don't have it anymore. Hey, there's, a, I think, a painting, right? That's, a, that's yeah, that's a charcoal drawing, technically, since charcoals are basically a, uh, rocks, uh, you know, that you kind of just rub off onto paper. So they're really more like pencils than anything else. And you can use a variety of things. You can use a combination of pencils for, like, fine lines or like willow charcoal, which is basically like sticks. Uh, they're kind of like shaped briquettes almost. And yeah, so this one used to at least like four different kinds of charcoal, I think went into making this particular one. It's definitely one of my favorites. So uh, hopefully the resemblance is quite reasonable. Yeah, dude, um, this looks great. Yeah, how big I did, is this? Uh, I did another like portrait. Like for context, how, how, how big is this? Uh, uh, about like 14 inches tall, I think. Oh, that's, that's a something like that. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at Glenn's pumpkin here. Boom. Dude. Yeah, I think I tweeted this when I did it for Halloween last year, but yeah, it came out really good. I was happy with it. Yeah, this is amazing. Are you kidding me? I can't even come close to this. Holy It's cow. easier than you'd think, I promise. I like just watched one video about like pumpkin carving and then just went to town. They yeah. don't tell you it's easy to fix your mistakes too. Like that, the leftmost upper tooth on Venom just like fell off completely. I just put a toothpick in it and jammed it right back in. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Little dental work for Venom there. That's funny. All right, so finally, we're getting to travel. I heard you recently had a trip to Ireland. 
can you share with us a little bit about your excursion how long you were there all that stuff yeah yeah it was great we were there about two weeks i think like 13 days precisely my, my it was my wife's idea to do the trip she went there to to see the taylor swift concert with one of her friends and i joined up afterward and we rented a car and just drove from dublin to cork to galway back to dublin so big triangle around the south of ireland checking out a variety of things along the way really really loved the trip saw all kinds of great sites blarney castle was really cool did go on a tour to see the cliffs of moor from a boat and from the top both very worthwhile views if you happen to make it out there um i'm not much of a sightseer generally when i travel even though i have traveled a lot but the cliffs are one of the things where i was like okay this is actually pretty rad like uh, not a lot nice. of things live up to the hype this one lived up to the hype very cool would you say that that's that was your favorite part of the trip or the cliffs uh it's up there we had a really great steakhouse too but that was kind of more confined but yeah this this the cliffs were certainly the coolest sight that we saw quite easily other than that i mean just you know hanging out with my wife in a variety of places was really the best the best part just we know ne neither of us had ever been there so like just seeing different restaurants or chatting about like why was this this way or which food was good and, and you all get that to was do really it nice without having kids nagging you the whole time it's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah that is true <laughs> that's that, i mean that's one of the things i'm looking forward to snapcon here in a few days is me and the wife get to get away for five days without children which is super fun a reprieve yeah, yeah. yeah that's the trickiest sure. part of us for vacationing is finding care for three dogs it's tricky so we got lucky our neighbor across the street also has a pit bull and it turns out that their boyfriend and girlfriend marco and penny so they're more than welcome to to leave their dog here and vice versa so we got a nice system rolling there you mentioned a steakhouse which is funny because i'm a bit of a foodie and the next question is did you have any dope <laughs> food while you were there yeah i mean the the steakhouse we got went to on like the last night i think that we were in dublin was i think it was dublin it was really amazing they had like a a flight of steaks like 17 ounces you share shared for two people for like 50 euro just an amazing deal that's nuts and so good yeah dude so a good flight? yeah yeah there's uh four different cuts and the filet was not the best cut so yeah i think the i think the ribeye was the best cut it was but it was all really good nothing nothing was bad awesome well and, we have some go ahead i'm sorry yeah. i didn't mean to i was just say that murphy's ice cream is a chain there but it was also really exceptional we liked that a lot what is there any particular flavor there that you were into or uh, they had like a, a chocolate whiskey that was really good but all of it was quite amazing i think butterscotch is probably my favorite that i tried while we were there yeah oh god that sounds delicious yeah. all right we got some pictures of the trip guys let's look at ireland first one up Ooh, what's this yeah it's a uh, blarney castle blarney stone is not quite visible it's, it's on the other side of the castle from here Basically, or I should say, like, I think it's actually on the left mo the left wall, so you can kind of see where it would be positioned, if I recall do they, correctly. Do they let you get closer, or is this as, as close as you can get? Oh, no, we were up on the top there. We walked by that bell, bell that you see at the top. We oh, kissed the stone cool. and everything. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's neat. They let you go up there still. All right, cool. Next one up. Yeah, it's quite a, quite a trek. Yeah, here's the cliffs from the top. This is beautiful. A little bit of a hike to get this view, but yeah, really, really loved it. Oh man, even the skyline? Good grief, this is a great shot. Yeah, I know they filmed some Harry Potter down at the, the lower end there. That was one of the things our tour guide let us know. I think like the book book six, I think is what it, where it was, something like that. Very cool. All right, well, that wraps up the personal portion of the QA. Thank you for being so open with us, Glenn. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, we course, do have some community questions that we got submitted ahead of time that we're gonna go over. So first up, what is your favorite scene from the Billy Madison movie? Hey, I am an Adam, an Adam Sandler friend, a uh, fan, a formative part of my my childhood for sure. Although, you know, if, if Adam wants to be friends, just hit me up. Uh, <laughs> sir, I don't remember their, their name. Yeah, but I, I remember this, the principal the was blob. like an ex wrestler. Yeah, the blob and like comes comes back in a pivotal scene at the end in full regalia to take down <laughs> the antagonist. <laughs> Yes. I'm a big fan of delivering on promises like that in movies. So yeah, I think that was a real, a real nice instance of it. Very cool. All right. What next is, what is your favorite variant? Yeah, I've shared, I've know I've shared this one, at least on discord, but yeah, Peach, Peach Momoko's magic is currently my favorite just has like a real intensity to it. I love Peach, such an amazing style. Watercolor is another art medium that I dabbled in before I kind 
kind of settled into charcoal because it's way easier to maintain all of my tools. Uh, but I, I do like watercolor a lot, and I think Peach just does amazing stuff. Looks like nothing else. So we we have a video of this split that you provided. Let's take a look, guys. Oh, look at that with a cosmic red. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. That's super cool. All right. And what do you think the most perfectly balanced card is? And why is it Magneto? Yeah, I saw the why is it Magneto. And honestly, Magneto is probably one of the best answers to the question for sure. Interestingly, I know I before I even started on Snap, one of my friends who's still a director here at on Snap had said like Magneto was a card that they weren't sure if it was like really good or not good at all uh, in their like pre pre beta test <clears throat> pre beta release testing. He was a he was a Magneto stand, so he he won out on that one. Good call for I by him. Yeah, I think Magneto's a great answer. Wasp, I think, is probably pretty high up there, notably in part because, like, there's just no other balance point for that particular design, right? Like, zero, it has to be zero. If it's zero, it, ha it basically has to be one. So just fundamentally balanced by mathematical principle. Right on. Next question involves Umbaku. Why can't he also jump from your hand at the end mm -hmm. of the game if it's in your hand? Yeah, I, I see this suggestion a lot, and it's actually, I think, kind of instructive on some game design principles, which first off, I'll, I won't take the principle, like, Mbaku's not very good. We, we, we're cool to be in agreement on that. It's not, just not a strong card. And the effect doesn't currently fire off at a satisfying rate. But from like a principle of like how we should design the cards, like designing Mbaku to just be the same, but he comes from hand, would kind of just whittle away like the essence of the card as like a, an actual card. Because right now, what do you do with Mbaku? You just hope to not draw him, basically, right? Like that's really all, all you, that you do. If you do draw him, you can play, pay one energy and play him. So this would, all this would change is the same thing would be true, except now you wouldn't pay one energy and play him. So he would function less like a card, even though the effect would be stronger, he would be less, he would actually have less identity as a useful card. Like Lockjaw is theoretically like a place you could have previously been enjoying M'Baku as, as an example, right? And at some times it, it was reasonable. So yeah, like we could just make him zero costs and not change the text. And that's like basically the same thing, right? But that doesn't, that's not a satisfying solve for this problem either maybe but I'd, I'd be more inclined to put him in lists if i knew that if i drew him again after feeding him into lockjaw i wouldn't be punished by having him right like he'd yeah. still do his thing i, I think that's reasonable so I'm, I'm not saying that the ask is like unreasonable i'm just illustrating i use this i use a metaphor in teaching called a uh, duct tape which is like a lot of people when they see a problem with a game piece is they break out the duct tape they're like what's the problem the, this part of the experience sucks I'm going to put some duct tape on that, and now that part's fixed. It's like, okay, well, but now you have duct tape all over it, and that doesn't look very good, <laughs> or this isn't going to hold, or, you know, there's all kinds of issues. Right. So, like, the real key here is, isn't that when I draw M'Baku, he won't p proc at the end of the game. The problem is when I draw M'Baku, I am sad. So that's the actual problem that you need to fix when you want to adjust the design. How do you make it satisfying to draw M'Baku, given that the design is structured to reward not drawing him? So like an example, this isn't one I intend to implement, but like we, I, I did debate it briefly at one point. I was like, what if he said, you know, like on reveal, plus one power, shuffle me into your deck. Like now I've got something going on here where there's a reason for me to be excited to draw M'Baku, or there's some kind of payoff that I can then be rewarded for later in the game. So that's an example of a solve that I think actually addresses the core problem. Whereas I think putting him in your hand, like it's a buff, like we, we can do it, but it doesn't address the core problem. And it's an interesting thing to compare to Angel because they're actually really different cards, right? Like M'Baku right. is, fantasy is to come at the end of the game and to swing the result. Angel's fantasy is not that at all. Angel's fantasy is to provide more fodder to this destroy deck to chain into more interesting plays. So it is beneficial for Angel to fire from hand because it is additive to that fantasy of enabling ter plays on turns three and four that contribute to the game plan of a deck that might want to play Angel. Whereas for M'Baku, do that doesn't really do it nearly as much. It's about the same as just taking an energy off the cost. Right on. Next question says, are there any other games right now that give you inspiration to add to Marvel Snap? Oh yeah, I mean, co constantly. It's less Marvel Snap specifically, but just games in general. I, I love seeing what other people are doing, analyzing it, finding like what's something they might've missed or what's something that's doing something cool that I didn't think of or that they maybe didn't think of before and added to. So and I also use the same things for teaching. Like I'm always on the lookout for games that 
can serve as good examples to, to students or to help better illustrate concepts. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of foundational games that I think are really important to understand from a game design standpoint, and especially Snap. I think chess and poker are both quite useful to understanding like what is good and important in playing games of Snap. Uh, I think they both have a lot to teach. Especially but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of CCGs have cool ideas. Gwent, Keyforge. Uh, there's a there's actually a card game inside of Genshin Impact called Genius Invocation that I think is really cool. It's a little bit reminiscent of the Transformers TCG in in some ways, which is a game I worked I, I worked alongside at Wizards and thought had a lot of cool ideas as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for fascinating, fascinating little things. Once Upon a Galaxy just released in beta and is doing like a Kickstarter. I like I like those guys, the the Storybook Brawl team. I think they did some really good work on Storybook Brawl and, and this game looks cool too. So I've been enjoying checking out their beta. Next question says, are there any plans to add customization to the profile page with maybe some of your favorite avatars, your your line or variants, anything of that matter? I'm not on that team specifically. I imagine the answer is probably a somewhat nebulous yes. Like we have this first instance of the profile kind of out now. Yeah. Um, so seeing how players interact with it, what they like about it, what they wish it had, what they wish it didn't have, like that's, that's all feedback that I know some team is collecting and then eventually will probably pursue like what would a V2 look like or what would an improved version of this right. concept look like like maybe a profile is not even the right way to go about it maybe we want something totally different right no i understand but it'd be cool to like like i have cool variants i'd like to show off to my yeah. alliance friends or whatnot or maybe even you know an infinity avatar that's like banging that we just got this season i don't know something of that nature yeah i think there's definitely opportunity it's a it's is a like resource intensive kind of ask and it's also the sort of thing where you definitely want to measure once cut or measure twice cut once so you don't really want to be redoing that kind of visual work over and over since it requires a lot of ui commitment but yeah i, I think there's potential to have a more exciting and satisfying thing and hopefully we can continue to iterate awesome and are you able to give us some insight as to what will be marvel snap kang's fate i am not i i do intend to to rework kang i haven't stumbled upon the thing that feels just just right so to speak the it's a tricky it's a tricky thing like we want to make kang like awesome like there you know there are a lot of players who picked Kang up because they love the character, they picked him up maybe because they loved the mechanic, maybe just the VFX was really dope, like that, you know, all, there are customers for all of those particular exciting parts of the card, like, and we, we want to make sure whenever we make a card, it's for a really wide audience, uh, we want to try and satisfy all of them. In the case of Kang, like, to some extent, we did satisfy some of those people, right? Like, they d decided to pick up the card. So, in making the experience of playing with Kang better, we don't want to lose the experience that brought people to to Kang in the first place. And that's kind of the line that's tricky to navigate on Kang. We don't want to, you know, be kicking him around in a lot of different designs. We want to try and figure out something that's right and get it get it right on the first go if we can. And I think in particular, figuring out whether we want to hearken to the current design of like rewinding a turn or figuring out if it's okay to just totally abandon rewinding a turn completely and pursue a different way to tell the time travel story. I think we're leaning towards the latter, but that just adds even more pressure because it's like, okay, well, if we're gonna abandon the core premise of the original design, it's even more important that it just be a solid gold banger now because anyone who's sad about that losing out on the, the undoing of the turn, we wanna make sure that they're happy about what is replacing it. Speaking about transformative cards, the, the change to Spider-Man I think is so much better than its original iteration. Oh, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. All right, yeah, next that was one that came up in my interview, actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Like, wait a minute, your interview for Marvel Snap? Like my, my interview for joining Second Dinner, one of the questions okay. I remember getting asked was, like, what's a mistake, I think? It was something along the lines of, like, what's a mistake you think we've made so far? Or so something along those lines. And I was like, it's a mistake to make Spider-Man the card that he is. Like, he should be the most exciting character that you want hundreds of, like, you want everybody to be happy playing Spider-Man. You don't want anyone to feel like, oh, that card's not fun. Yeah. Right. I mean, he was even more unfun during the season. That was, whew. Let's not go there. Yep. I'm, I'm getting flashed. That was like very early in my tenure. I think here yeah, that was like your first month, man. <laughs> it was. Yeah. The the OTA to correct Silver Surfer and Zabu was one of the first like actual job actions I took. Oh, that's super cool. 
All right, next question says, will we ever see more deck slots or a method of obtaining them? Yeah, I think that's a, a win, not an if, to coin a, a popular Mark Rose order parlance for answering questions. Yeah, I think that's a win. Nice, all right. And then this next one is, it's a little self-serving, so I'm, I'm sorry, Glenn. But can the creators, the Marvel Snap creators, can we get our own custom card back? It's an interesting idea. I'm not really on the team that would make them or the team that would decide who gets them, which are both complex issues and challenges. It's an interesting thing because rewards in Marvel Snap, like we want there to be some amount of feeling like you have something really special that you've earned and acquired. Uh, but at the same time, that means that for a lot of people, they're like, oh, if I see something that's amazing, like I want to have a path to get it. I know that was actually a complaint very early before I even joined Second Dinner with like the early infinite card backs, where if you're people feeling like, oh, I can't make infinite, I don't get the awesome Venom card back, like that's really frustrating. And I sympathize with them, like, yeah, that's a frustrating thing to have to struggle with. So that was part of why Second Dinner shifted to the gold treatment. So now, you know, you can always get some version of the card back, basically, it's very accessible. So yeah, that's ki that's kind of why it's a little bit iffy. I'm not saying like it's a, a bad idea or anything. I think it's interesting, but balancing out like having a really satisfying system for who would get it, and then also making it something that it feels like good for content creators to have it without kind of cutting off a potential dream for other other people uh, would be the line I, I think might make sense. That's and it's tricky to navigate that. Speaking of card backs, is there any plans to bring a shield card back? Back into the, the shield card back back. Yeah. I, I assume probably. I know we've done that with some of the other card backs, so I, I imagine it is at place in the pipeline somewhere. Because I certainly it's not like we, we don't benefit from keeping the card back away from people either. Sure. So like it's just figuring out what's the best way to do it. How do we uh, make sure people who do enjoy did enjoy some of these things for their exclusivity? Like what's the the right line to navigate on that? I think is again like I'm not on the team responsible for that. But yeah, I, I imagine that we'll find an answer to that question in, in the future. All right, we're, we're winding down to the last few questions here. Any plans to fix the visibility of Black Crackle? That's another one where I know the answer is yes, and I know very little more than that. But yeah, we, we hear you. Right we, we want Black Crackle to be cooler too. Yes, make Black Crackle great again. <laughs> next question says, why hasn't Conquest been, excuse me, iterated on more? like varied avatar borders, like different colors and effects on them, perhaps even changing some of the loading screens or click screens to make it more streamlined. Yeah, we have we have put a little bit into Conquest more than people realize just in like kind of fixing up some things that didn't quite run the way we wanted. We'd actually scoped Conquest meaningfully different from what wound up launching. We had to, we kind of sanded off some things as we went. I do, however, think that we've kind of left an opportunity on the table to make it a better, more engaging game mode. There are a variety of reasons for that of, of you know, like any company of, of like varying quality relative to me personally, other people, you know, smart people can disagree on all kinds of things. Sure. Um, I think that Conquest could, could be a better game mode for us. I have a lot of ideas about Conquest that I'm excited to talk to people about when we can kind of dedicate some resources in that direction, but I don't have anything for anyone right now. Just just the pat, pat, like I know that Glenn also wants Conquest to be dope, and I think that we can make Conquest pretty, pretty awesome at some point. I just don't know exactly when. I agree. I agree 100 percent i think at, at the very least we can we can do like color tints on the swirly thing around your border it doesn't have I to have, be monthly I have some larger ideas but yeah yeah and part of it is also i i don't want to get into in when we have something like this where we've let it sit for a long time i think it also is kind of not super useful to just like make very minor improvements a lot of the people who might enjoy them have already kind of checked out and are not really paying attention to them. So I really like approaching it from the standpoint of like, you know, let's take a lot of like, let's do a lot at once and really present like, this is a new thing. Like we've we've revisited it and, and improved the experience more dramatically. I think that's the better way to go on features like this to just ensure that people get like a satisfying number of eyeballs on it and, it, and that it can really become what we want it to be within the community, which is just, yeah, a, a popular way to play Snap that feels like a meaningful alternative to, to, to the latter. I dig it. The only thing that I don't dig is that from start to finish, it takes like four hours, <laughs> you know? Yeah, if, it is quite lengthy. I mean, yeah. I think our 
I know internally before launch, the kind of perception was a lot more that people would be much more willing to do like, you know, one battle and come back and hit it later. And I think it's you know, certainly content creators, that's not how they're going to approach it. But I think we've even seen among less deeply engaged players than those who stream it, that there is a lot of passion to just finish the run, to like get it started and then get it done. And I don't think the original structure of the mode is especially conducive to that. Like you can do it, but it's, it's a definitely a meaningful commitment. Yeah, and it's a huge commitment, man. I, I I was able to do it one time from start to finish on a stream, and it, it took all of the stream, especially with, with how long like yeah. the games last. Oh, man. All right, anyways, enough about Conquest. Thank you so much for being so incredibly candid with us. Last question, and this might be a little spicy, right? But... What is your take on the current release of the Deadpool's League? Like like Diner, it's not a feature I was directly really involved in. I actually mostly most of the league work I had participated in had been done pre with the first version of it that we launched mm -hmm. uh, a few like couple months ago. So yeah, I think that I know that there were some snafus with Deadpool's Diner. I know Griffin has made some announcements in the Discord about it. The win trading exploit was certainly not how we intended the the feature or the event to be participated in. So we'll you know we're gonna make sure everybody gets the Deadpool emotes and whatever iteration we next take with leagues will certainly account for this particular issue. Yeah, not the experience that we set out to do. And like I've mentioned before, you know we really approach things from the perspective of. Yeah, like, let's try it, figure out what we need to make better, make it better, go again. We try to not be afraid to get things wrong. Uh, we think, in general, you can make a lot of bad decisions if you're constantly afraid to make any decisions. So I, I much rather try, would much rather be trying things and getting the data and figuring out what people will actually enjoy and how to make the game amazing for them long term than kind of being cowards would be the other, the other way I might phrase it is, you know, like just taking the I, I... safe path and... I appreciate you guys taking risks, especially with some card balancing things that you've done pretty recently. So that that's been incredibly rewarding to see, and and not something like very like the worst thing is waiting for OTAs or patches, and then it's like it comes out stale. You know, like you guys really added some some good spice to it, and I I, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> it's been thanks. It's, it's made my job uh, relatively easy. I appreciate that. I think how are you doing on time by the way? I don't I don't want to Yeah, I'm good. All right, so Nick, I have another question. I'm just going to throw it out to you and if if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. But can you share with us how you determine what cards would be available for a buff or like like what cards you would look for to give a little juice to? Like what are, what are the parameters? Mm -hmm. What 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 what's involved in that process if you don't mind? Yeah, I've I've talked about it a little bit publicly and i don't mind talking about it in general in depth it's just hard to really demonstrate it without being able to show things sure um but yeah i mean for starters there's the very basic things we look at you know every week i do a pretty thorough look through all of the like best performing clusters we call them which are groups of cards whose play rates are correlated at really strong frequencies um so basically if something is played you know with another within a cluster like about 30 percent of the time or whatever it shows up for us to kind of peek at and we can scale that up or down depending on exactly how much we want to look at like do we want to adjust a card maybe we, maybe we want to make sure we hit an archetype really hard so we'll scale it up and only look at things that have like a really high like 80 percent correlation things like that so you're you're talking about um, like like if sentry and annihilus like that grouping yeah exactly okay, okay. like in the the sentry annihilus deck certainly those cards correlated like well over 80 percent with each other right now i think like loki in rsm is like above 90 percent like 95 percent something like that uh for example like we know that those cards like if you're playing this group of cards that tend to go into rsm like it's very likely loki is in that group just based on the actual play rates of all of the cards in in cooperation with each other and we and we check their win rates like within that context like knowing how good you know a card is in shuri might not be very informative for how good it is in like you know at Patriot or whatever, like the, there's just totally different things here going on there. Just choose randomly disparate code decks. So we want to know whether the card is like if a card's very good in one deck and really medium in another, like maybe it's not the right nerf candidate to buff to hurt that second deck because we would actually be hurting this other deck way more. So we, we look at that all the time. Uh, certainly when identifying like just raw buff and nerf candidates, we take a look at what a card's overall 
performance is, like its cube rate, its play rate, its win rates. If we have a card that's just showing up like way too much in way too many decks, that's usually indicative that there might be a problem. And then we'll go back and look at the clusters and see like, okay, like, is it like actually the best card in one of these decks or is this deck just really good? And it just is benefiting from that. Sauron was memorably a card that received that kind of a benefit where for like many, many months, Sauron was just straight up the winningest card in Marvel Snap. But that was because yeah. only one deck played Sauron and it was a good deck there and you contrast that with angela for example who's also lifetime like one of the greatest cards in the history of marvel snap but there were lots of people putting angela in decks that weren't very strong so she right. her win rate would be reduced pretty substantially no one was accidentally playing sauron right like if you had sauron you had <laughs> right fair enough that mean yeah so sauron that, was a world kind of stuff, for a while yeah. everybody thought shuri was dead after that the shuri changed mm -hmm. it's like no 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 sauron's still here he gets the job yeah, done. and from there we slice it in a lot of different ways. I tend to mostly compare like the top half percent of the player base on MMR against like the wider player base to kind of see like how the metagame differs within like the most competitive players and the players who represent kind of the more average level of like skill and dedication to the game because we want the changes to actually impact the right audience, right? Like if I if I make top infinite balanced i've balanced the game for an audience of like 60 people <laughs> like that's a very small audience to have uh actually done an effective piece of work for so uh we always want to make sure that our changes in aren't hitting the wrong group the wrong way and then often it'll kind of adhere to other plans uh you know if we have a card coming up in a spot like cash or a bundle we'll often try and time a buff to you know kind of show up around when that's going to be because that's going to give people the opportunity to play with the card we know it's dissatisfying when something like leaves the spotlight cash and we buff it like almost immediately after like sometimes we just think it's the right thing to do like if the card's very new we mostly think that's correct to do but if it's been around a while and we have something we'd like to try out it's like okay well just wait until there's a good time like moon knight was actually a really good recent example where we had vfx that we liked that was coming in and we just waited until the vfx were ready to go and then we debuted the fix alongside the vfx and we were really happy with that he looks so good and he plays great yeah. single single yeah, card really activates proxima and stature oh, oh, oh my god it's so good yeah that change was one of my like oh glenn you're so clever moments i think <laughs> any any another self-serving question and i'm you know you feel free to shoot me down here any chance doc can, can get a shard brought down to zero instead of one cost uh, it's interesting i it actually was zero when we were developing the card for a little bit we wound up liking it at one more mostly because of killmonger and how much we were putting killmonger and x23 and all of our our deck and decks, it felt like it might wind up being, if not an actual nerf, at least like dissatisfying. Like it, even if the deck was better because it's zero, it was more frustrating to have Killmonger not kill it. So that's like a really tricky spot for the shard. It is, I think, one of those interesting cards that's just like a half power off. Like at three, three, five is just seems pretty clearly not appropriate but three four is like a little bit too weak we actually had dakin at two three for a really long time internally but that one didn't get quite big enough to really feel like it was worth the investment right. so yeah pretty pretty tricky card to land uh half power is one of those values that every every game has something where they eventually are like i wish i could do half of this number and there's only really one way to do that which is you know multiply all of your numbers by two and now you can do it so i it, it's dawning on me that i may not have an opportunity to talk to someone who's who's so knee deep in the data and this is something that i've always been interested in my dog is is here and he's now getting ready to attack me i'm sorry um <laughs> Thank you, relax. Are you able to share the percentage of the player base that has reached infinite from like when it first launched to like now, like has that percentage changed at all? Because it is a lot easier, at least I think with the current setup, right? It's mm -hmm. seven cubes. You get the bonus three every time you hit a tenor. Before it was like, <laughs> you got to win 10. You're not getting anything extra. Like you're sweating it out, homie. Yeah. Are you able to share yeah, those percentages with us? I can't share like the, the actual numbers. That's something that our our data and product teams prefer to keep private, okay. uh, since they can be used to, you know, backwards infer a number of things about like our, our KPIs, key performance indicators. But we, you're totally right that when the game launched, Infinite was a much more select and hard to approach part of the game than it is today, and we have made a lot of changes to push in that direction some 
within design, some within just the structural structural of the system, as you called out with the the change in the number of ranks it took to actually jump. So yeah, we've we del deliberately increased that. Part of it is because we think that, you know, getting to infinite is an awesome fantasy for players. Uh, we don't want it to feel, we want it to feel like if you th would like to be infinite, like that it is an achievable dream for you. If you don't feel that that's true, then that kind of feels like a failure to us. Certainly I kind of felt that way with regard to when I was playing Hearthstone a lot, like Hearthstone Legend, where I was, I knew I made Hearthstone Legend a number of times and I knew I certainly could like any given season that I was like, I want to do this, I can do it. But just the raw time commitment being the barrier was not a super fun gate for me because that's just a gate that I don't want to have to pay to pass, basically. Um, right. So we wanted to make sure that for Infinite, at least, like that was something that players, if they want to come here and be competitive, and specifically, if you want to feel like you're getting better season over season, we want to make sure that that's achievable. So if someone wants to make Infinite and maybe they miss a first season or two and then they make it for the third one, like that's a great journey for them. We want them to have that journey. If they get incrementally closer for months on end without ever accomplishing the goal, it just kind of doesn't feel very good. Uh, even if it's effective, like they're they're just not receiving the feedback that they want that's most rewarding, so. Yeah, no. Great answer. Thank you so much for, for answering it. I believe that's it for the community questions I have. Let me let me just take another opportunity to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You've been an amazing guest. You've been great. Very candid with us. I've I've enjoyed my time with you. I hope you had fun. And chat, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Glenn. Tell us where we can find you. You want to share your socials or? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter. I think Glenn underscore Jones underscore is my, uh, and you can always ask me questions in the official Marvel Snap Discord under Ask the Team. You can find me uh, answering a wide variety of things there. Um, yeah, you can feel free to, you know, ping me on Twitter if you have something that was pertinent to this conversation you want to ask. I, I really generally don't mind as long as it's just a you know, reasonable, polite question. I'm mostly happy to answer stuff like that. Well, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you hanging out. You have a great evening. Later, my dude. Bye, guys. All right. Dudes, that was awesome. Holy cow. I had so much fun. I really did.